Good afternoon, everybody. I'm super pleased to see you all here today. So many of you, uh, many familiar, friendly faces, clients, suppliers, of course, um, many people from the Compass family um, and other friends uh, that represent the industry uh, right across the board. Um, my name's Robin Mills. I'm the Managing Director for Compass Group in the UK and Ireland. Um, and we're delighted to be here in the Queen Elizabeth II Centre. Uh, we have, we've had a long standing partnership uh, with the QE2 Centre for uh, more than 30 years now. Uh, and, uh, and this is a climate neutral event, which means that we've done absolutely everything we can to reduce the carbon impact of the event. And then um, that which we can't reduce then we have uh, invested in some projects which are in the back of the e-brochure that you can see, which makes the whole thing uh, climate neutral. So you can feel rest assured and confident that you're doing the right thing by, uh, by being here. Uh, particular thanks as well to those who are registered online. Uh, and, um, and I hope that the online experience is just as good as the experience in the room. It's a little warm in here. I know um, the, uh, the air condition is working, the ventilation's working, it will cool down. Um, so uh, please, uh, please rest assured. There are some spaces at the front, predictably. Uh, so if you need a bit more space, then you can, you can come and join me down here. Um, as I said, we're, we're delighted to, uh, to host this conversation today. And I think at Compass, we feel that we're in a unique position with a big group of supplier friends and a big group of uh, client friends to be able to facilitate a conversation that means we can all journey together, and I'm sure that will be one of the, the themes of the, uh, of the event today. Um, the, the second thing to, uh, to mention is that um, it's important that you get the chance to take part in this conversation. So we're going to have three panels and lots of chances to ask questions. So if you download Slido, you can just do it very simply on your phone, uh, on the tables, and download the e-brochure then uh, you'll be able to take part in the conversation, ask your questions, and we'll get through as many of those um, as we can. So before I hand over to Dominic Blakemore, who is the Compass Group uh, Chief Executive, um, I thought it would be good if we could hear from some of our partner chefs. It's great to hear that Compass has launched its commitment to reach climate net zero by 2030. Being kinder to the world that we live in and the land that we get our fruits and veg from, it can only be a good thing. And as a chef, I think we can do a little bit to help the environment and maybe educate people of how to use these beautiful local ingredients to maximise on the plate. Coming from Wales and a very, very proud Welshman, I've always said Wales has one of the best food ladders on earth and we want to keep it that way. At the restaurants, we always cook the fruits and veg exactly the same way as we cook a piece of meat or fish, with the same respect and the same care and attention to detail. And this is how you get the maximum flavour out of these beautifully sourced local ingredients. If we all do our bit, we'll get there together and reach our goals by 2030. My absolute drivers in life are food, welfare of our planet and children. It's really important that children understand the journey that food goes through to go from farm to fork. Growing, tending, watering, buckets and buckets and tons of water, harvesting, transportation, processing, all of this has a massive impact on the environment. And that's just to get the beans on their plate, let alone the toast. Give them the information, the scenarios and the tools to make their own choices. Then show them what better looks like and how they can do that in their own kitchens. It's all part of the softly, softly approach of showing them that a sustainable life is a better life for them and in years to come for their children too. Sustainability is, is, is one of the most important things in the modern world. It is crucial, it's important, and it's something that we all need to be aware of. Sustainability should be at the forefront of everyone's thinking. My training program Forward has a module all about sustainability, and that is gonna show our chefs how to buy food, understand food, where it comes from, and why it is important. Sustainability, saving the planet, that should be a priority for everybody. Thank you very much, Robin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be with you here this afternoon, and it feels incredibly poignant that you know, we should be meeting here, 150 of us plus in the room and, and 300 online. That feels like a, a true hybrid event that we've been talking about so much. 
Um, and also, my last uh, public event was back in March of 2020, remarkably, with um, the UK Food Buy Supplier Conference. So I'm sure I was with many of you then, um, and it's great to be with you here again today. Um, it feels incredibly timely that we should be having this conversation around sustainability in the planet uh, as we come out of one of the most impactful events of our lives. Um, and and I, I reflect on the past 18 months and there's three big learnings that, that I take away. Um, the first has been around the widening gap of social equality or social inequality and what that means and, and the role that we play as a large employer in that space. The second is obviously around the, the planetary impact of climate change. Um, in many ways, this was part of the cause of what we've all lived. But at the same time, over these past 18 months, we've seen what a pause in many of our activities and choices can have beneficially for the planet. And I think that's also something we should, we should reflect on. And then finally, I think we've all realized um, what, what incredible uh, human endeavors can be achieved when we all pull together collaboratively for change. I think the, the greatest example, and I, I don't really need to mention it, was in the, the development of the vaccine, its deployment and distribution globally at the pace that we've seen. And quite simply without that, I'm not sure we would be here today, and I'm sure we would be in a, a very difficult position still. So when I reflect on those three things, and, and we're here for a conversation today about the planet, I think that if we can pull together, if we can collaborate, then I think we can have a truly meaningful impact and, and far quicker than perhaps we could ever imagine. When I reflect on, on Compass PLC as a large global company, we're in 50 countries. Uh, we employed 600,000 people worldwide before the pandemic. Um, we served 6 billion meals, effectively touching 6 billion consumers annually. And of course, that means that we buy nearly 10 billion pounds of food a year. And as we're all becoming more and more aware, over a quarter of GHG emissions now come from the, the food and agricultural systems. So we have a huge responsibility as that business to make a difference. And, and that opportunity is one which is exciting to the leaders of this business, that we can step in and influence and, and change things. And of course, not only do we have to address the deficit that's been built, but we also have to recognize that there will be not, not short of 10 billion people on the planet by 2050 that need to be fed sustainably. So the acceleration of that challenge is incredibly dramatic and urgent. And it's in that context that I'm really, really proud of our UK business. As a PLC, we'll be making commitments before the end of this year around net zero. And alongside that, we'll be making the, the appropriate science-based targets. But our UK business has stepped forward and, and made the pledge to be net zero by 2030. I believe it's brave. Um, they have a complete support of, of our organization. But of course, there are many plans that we know we can activate and, and we developed, but a lot relies on the people in this room, our clients, our consumers, our suppliers, to help us find new ways of doing things and influence and change choices such that we get the best possible outcomes. And that's really exciting, but it's brave and I'm proud. And I think you'll hear more of that today. It's also, this is also quite personal to me. It's something that I'm you know, seeking to make a difference on as an individual. And, and one of the roles that I've, I've taken on is as a keen supporter uh, and board member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And the WBCSD is, is it's, a, it's a group of 200 global companies um, who first, I think, sought to raise awareness around climate change, but now is truly moving to action collaboratively and together. And that means that the end-to-end -end supply chains can change and we can start to source products in ways we could never previously have imagined. And the WBCSD is, again, as I speak about moving from awareness to action, its 2050 vision has been relaunched as a time for change. And I think that really is now about everyone making joint commitments and working together collaboratively for those outcomes. I think I've said it several times now, but, but nothing will be achieved without partnership. Ultimately, we have to influence everyone in this room, but all of our end consumers, those five billion meals that we serve annually. And therefore, this really is about us working together to find the ways in which we can do that. Whether your suppliers helping us find alternative sources of supply, whether your clients helping us to influence colleagues, but also allowing us to work with you on your, your own ambitions. And of course, with our culinary teams, it's finding exciting and, and fabulous uh, culinary options that, that, that don't make 
this a point of difference, but something we all want to embrace. So before I close, I want to introduce Carolyn. Carolyn is going to uh, present on, on the UK's pledge. Uh, Carolyn is going to be our, or is our net zero execution director and has that brilliant combination of, of deep expertise in our industry, I think it's as much as 20 years, uh, but also a real passion and expertise in sustainability. And, and it's leaders like Carolyn we need now um, who can look at our industry differently and influence that change. So I'm just going to close by saying, you know, I truly believe that there is a moment in time now for us to, to, to make a difference. And I think what is good for the planet is good for people and, and is now good business. So thank you. And with that, over to Carolyn. Hello, everybody. Um, I personally lose sleep over our ability to achieve what Dominic and Robin have called out and what you'll have seen us announce recently. And I know that I'm not alone in saying that. Um, I think it's really clear to all of us that we are in a climate crisis as well as a crisis of nature. And whilst we are going to talk about the roadmap that we have published and worked on um, with the support of many who are in this room today. The most inspirational part of all of this is the opportunity that we have to use this drive and those that are already present in all of your organisations to affect systemic, wider industry change. It will be a really hollow victory if any of us with net zero commitments get there but have done so without having enlisted the wider support for real, radical, transformative change. So I think a key part of the roadmap, as you can see, is our ability to engage everybody in a way that has meaning for you, for them. It's really, uh, it's really easy to create admirable sentiment and to be able to advocate bold ambition. But what does it mean to each of us and how do we really get everyone to understand? So just to put that into a bit of context, what you had for lunch or breakfast this morning has far less conspicuous consequences than the burning of fossil fuels, for example. And yet what we eat and drink, as we know, when we include things like deforestation, livestock, food waste, has and ranks as number one in the greatest causes of global warming. So what we're talking about here and what net zero is really all about is the ability to turn these tables. The milestones on here represent some of the ways in which we've started to look at how we can do this. And that builds, as it does for many of you, on work that's been done in various parts of the organisation through incredible thought leadership for quite some time now. This is not about sharing things that are new. This is about enlisting and creating an extraordinary coalition of the willing to be able to create something that we can all really rally behind. We have thousands of people, as Dominic said, working all across the organisation. And what has been phenom phenomenal is that through, through coming forward in the way that we've started to collectively, uh, it's been really apparent just how invested people are personally in this agenda. And although this is not always, I think, associated with uh, some of the bigger corporates and multinationals, this is an unlocking of emotional daring as much as it is taking the opportunity to, um, to really go after what is essentially a commercial imperative as much as it is a moral and environmental one. So you're going to hear more specifics today. You're going to hear from the very talented uh, Ryan around the work that we've been doing on the menu. Um, and you can see here, just in the spirit of calling out some specifics, some of the ways in which we want to be able to translate the overarching objective into action that can be delivered at a site level. So looking, for example, at a 25% switch from animal to plant-based protein and a 40% switch um, by 2030. I just wanted to call out there, as many of you will be aware, that we are really mindful of the need to tell the full story as we advocate switches like this. It would be really easy to denounce the eating of beef and celebrate and applaud us eating veg by the bucket loads. And yet the price tags from a carbon perspective attached to all of those are radical and radically unequal too. So we have to really understand 
the whole picture in order to be able to make sure that what we're doing is really honest and true and holds us to the overarching objective, which is not just to reduce the emissions, but to do so in a way that helps us transition in support of the wider society as a whole and the future that our children will inherit. Mine are four and seven tomorrow, and as I said at the beginning, I really lose sleep over how we are able to really affect the sort of change that they deserve. So I'll just close by saying thanks so much for staying awake with me and with us um, as we really push forward in a way that, frankly, I, I can't imagine working for an organisation that wasn't working towards this. So look forward to hearing all the speakers and I will pass back. Thank you, Carolyn, and um, looking forward to birthday celebrations tomorrow, uh, no doubt. So um, our final speaker in this first um, section uh, is Andrew Griffith, MP, who is the um, UK Net Zero Business Champion, appointed in November, I'll keep it short, I promise, uh, appointed in November uh, 20 um, by the Prime Minister to um, encourage and help and champion and support businesses um, achieve and set credible net zero targets by 2050 or, or sooner. Um, we are here with the food plan um, uh, announced last week and less than 100 days or 100 days this week to COP26 uh, from this week. So never a more poignant time, I think, to hear from Andrew. Thank you, Robin, and it's fantastic to be here uh, in person um, with one of the UK's leading businesses, um, and it's absolutely on strike with my role. Businesses changing the world, uh, making the UK more successful and acting as global leaders. So thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Thank you, too, for your leadership. Uh, in setting a 2030 target that positions you at the leading edge of ambition um, and there's a great deal to do uh, but it's fantastic to see I love that slide Carolyn that was fantastic turning that high level abstract target into a series of practical tractable steps uh, that I suspect you're all going to hear a lot more about uh, this afternoon and make no doubt about it uh, sustainable food and I see here today we've got the whole industry, you've brought together uh, the whole supply chain from farm to fork, um, is absolutely central to this agenda. It's an incredibly important domain. And I think it punches twice. You punch once in terms of your own carbon footprint and the impact, but also that relationship with consumers. You talked, I think, about six billion meals. That's a whole other scope in its own right, because we've got to make this change uh, by bringing people with us. It's also a really auspicious time. You have great perspicacy and foresight, uh, because we've just really just wrapped up the G7. We're just writing up the notes uh, and sending them around the, the, the diplomats in the world. And we have, as you say, 100 days to go until the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, catered by yours truly. Um, and that really is a big, big opportunity. It's, uh, I think John Kerry put it really well uh, when he said it's the last best chance to save our planet. Big enterprise, literally bringing together the, the leaders of the whole world. Um, the UK's role within that is to set ourselves, as we have, really stretching targets. So you're all working with or for an incredibly progressive company, and you should be proud of that. But you should also be proud of the position of leadership that the UK has taken. Our latest Carbon 6 budget sees us aspire to reduce the level of carbon emissions from this country, including new domains like air transport, for the first time by 78% by 2035. That on an economy, on a country level, including all, uh, all scopes uh, and all forms of activity. That's genuinely one of the most ambitious targets on the whole planet, and our objective is to leverage that into global action. Lead by example, uh, make a big imprint using our global supply chains. Some of the UK's businesses are central to the globe's business community, as indeed you are. So if you're pirating new techniques, if you're finding new ways to measure, 
if you're sourcing new suppliers and you're working with new partners in one country, you're doing it in other countries as well. You're solving the problem and then we can cascade that globally. There are huge opportunities from getting this right. The new sustainable economy, the new trend to decarbonisation is a new industrial revolution. It's a new way, as we saw with Henry's report, the second instalment of that report last week. Really, we've never fed the planet on a global scale with the population we have today in a sustainable way. You're going to be at the forefront of recreating that food economy. But we're doing exactly the same in energy. Half of all of the energy that we're now producing in the UK is from renewable sources. We are decarbonising while you sleep. Your fridges plugged in are being decarbonised by that work that's going on on the grid. The automotive sector transforming itself, an end to the internal combustion engine in new vehicles by 2030. And in other hard to abate domains, whether it's the construction industry or Jet Zero, uh, pioneering carbon free aviation, business and innovation are absolutely at the heart of that journey. So you are central to that. My final words are, look, this is not a competitive domain. We're all each other's keeper on climate. It's fantastic, therefore, that you've brought together all participants here today, uh, within, without the industry, uh, the people that are making the decisions uh, around procurement, uh, and you're working with other non-state actors, non-business actors as well, because we're all shared in the success of what our global leaders are doing, but when they put away the flags, when they've written the resolutions, when they've taken the photographs and posted all the selfies, the people who are actually going to make the change, the organisation is business, and the people that are going to do it are all in this room here today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, um, Dominic, and Karen. Maybe we've just got time for some questions. Um, so this is my first go with the iPad. Um, and uh, let's see if we've got some questions coming through. Um, so maybe one for Carolyn to start. So we, we've just got a couple of questions. So um, whilst we're asking one question, if you can multitask, then maybe we'll get some more going, and then you can get in the habit uh, for the day. So maybe one for Carolyn to start. Is your net zero commitment for all scopes of carbon, direct and indirect, all limited to scope and one and scope one and two. Maybe you can say that, Carolyn. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if this is uh, working. Is there? Can everyone hear? Yeah. Okay. I'm used to being told that I shout, so I just wanted to check I wasn't <laughs> booming. Um, yes, it is. Uh, the commitment that we've made is a climate net zero target by 2030, which covers all scopes one, two, and three. And just to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, that was a very conscious decision that we made, given that the majority of our emissions sit within scope three, which won't surprise you given the nature of the business activities that Compass looks after. And so for us, if we're really serious and true to our commitment to affect proper meaningful change, we wouldn't have been able to do so without including that third scope. So yes, absolutely it does. Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, and Andrew, maybe, um, uh, maybe, uh, you could talk about COP26 a little bit in terms of how important that might be for the UK and uh, a milestone on the journey. Well, it's incredibly important for all of us, actually. I mean, it's, it's a UN event. It's a sort of blue hat event. It's where the UK is hosting it. We're the secretariat. There are diplomats running around the world now having conversations. They started at the G7 uh, where there was action taken on climate. Uh, pledges like 30 by 30 which is saving 30% of the world's oceans uh, by 2030. That was an outcome that was agreed to by the G7. Uh, we move on to the G20 uh, in Italy, uh, and then Glasgow starts on the 1st of November. So it's really, really important to the planet, but there's also a role for everybody. There are tens of thousands of people that go, um, and by one of my roles for the Prime Minister is to get as many businesses signed up so if you're, um, obviously, Compass have, have done this. This is a fantastic uh, leading uh, position. But if you're a small business, for example, uh, if you're here because you're a supplier, you can sign up to the same target, the Race to Zero initiative, 
uh, comes out of the science-based targets initiative, so it's very respected. It comes from the UN. The UK government are supporting it. What we would love is as many businesses to make those pledges as possible, so that as our world leaders go into the room, and it'll be a room a little bit more stuffy than this one, but not a million miles different. It'll not have many windows. So as they go in the room, and late in the night, try and thrash out the scale of ambition. And remember that 78% figure I talked about? That's what the UK are doing. We need most of the Northern Hemisphere to sign up to that level of decarbonisation to stop the Earth heating up by one and a half degrees. That's what it ultimately comes down to. That's what you look for in your papers the day after COP to know whether it's been successful or not. There's some other aspects around it as well, but that's what it's all about. But I want everyone here to feel very connected. There's a very clear line of individual action, business action, making pledges exactly as you have done today, um, and then that cascading up to give leaders the confidence to take action themselves. And then um, maybe just a final one for Dominic, just from a sort of global perspective in terms of what you see in terms of the environment in the other countries versus the environment in the UK, sort of public opinion and so on, um, from Laura. Yeah, it, it remains a, a very picture. I think what's absolutely fascinating is the UK's leading. I think the UK's leading from a government standpoint, but also from, um, certainly for us, a, a sector and client standpoint. I think that's a wonderful place for us to be. Um, I think it's why you know, much of what we can do together will create best practice for businesses like ours globally. So we're not just going to have an impact here in the UK, but much more, more widely. Um, I think what we're also seeing is that there is an acceleration in pace everywhere. Uh, it's becoming a really important conversation. I, I spoke with the, um, the CEO of a Brazilian healthcare group, and I simply asked him, you know, what do we need to do to win more business with you? And he said, we've got to do more on the sustainability agenda together. And increasingly, with our clients, we have, we have, I think there are three themes that emerge in all of our conversations. It's inclusion, it's decarbonization, and it's the use of digital. And therefore, you know, as a, as a business globally, we have to have a really strong point of view and a leadership position on all of those. Great, thank you. Um, the audience have got into their stride now, but we've got two other panels, so I'm going to um, release you three and say thank you very much for uh, a really good start to the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and hunger. We had been making progress against these challenges in the prior <laughs> decade at this point. Now, in the last few years, we're starting to see it rise again. And COVID, of course, has played a huge role on that. It's not just impacting business and economics. It's also having a huge impact on hunger. We ex saw a tremendous growth in the number of hungry people. The, you, the global population last year, one in 10 people was undernourished. That's 881 million. So when we think about the ways that we work that can create the types of transformations that are needed, we have a big role to play in this puzzle. This work that we're doing to address climate challenge, like we're here talking about today, and nature and equity and nutrition and hunger, it's a hugely important business issue. It creates business challenge. We have to work on this for the security of business, but it creates business opportunity as well. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. So we can play a big role in addressing things like climate challenges. Compass's leadership in this space is key. Your commitments to net zero action, the way that you'll implement that can have such a big impact. With a footprint in over 45 countries serving more than 5 billion meals a year, your change, anything you do, anything we do here together creates a difference. Three million meals alone in the UK and Ireland, recognizing that's pre-COVID. When we think about what the net zero commitment means here in the UK, it just gives me such excitement and such pride to see that type of leadership. We're so proud at WBCSD to have Compass as a member. You know, Dominic, your role on the executive committee is key. You bring such a voice of everybody in this room to the discussions and the future and the strategies of what business leadership looks like to embed sustainability into operations, into how we serve our consumers, our clients, our customers. The team that is co-leading the work on positive nutrition and consumer behavior change shows the role that you all play in shifting diets shifting diets, the ingredients selected, the climate impact of those ingredients, the nutrition impacts of those ingredients, that's what sets trends. So you're driving through your work here together, collective action at scale. And that's what this type of transformation needs to really be able to create food systems for the future that are healthy for everyone and healthy for our planet. We're gonna see several global events this year, starting at the end of this month with the Food Systems Pre-Summit, leading into the UN's first ever food summit at the end of September, all the way into the focus that the Climate Cup in November being held in Glasgow, that will, the Climate Cup will focus on food, its role on nature, its role on climate, its role in leading action. And by showing the type of ambition and action that Compass you've shown here on Net Zero and that all of you are playing a role in as you think about how to translate that type of ambition into your operations, how you address climate day to day and what you select and what you serve. It's incredibly exciting to see. That level of ambition, showing that into these key events gives hope and ambition to others. It allows governments, for example, to see it's possible we can do this together. And for that, I'll give you my personal thanks as well as recognition because this level of ambition is exactly what's needed. So, so excited to continue the conversation here today and just really so pleased to see these kinds of commitments taking shape into not just your strategies, but how you bring it into life with the food that you serve. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, so yeah, you, you've really got your eye in now on the questions, um, and uh, we will keep asking them to, uh, to our guests as they come up. Uh, but those that we can't answer um, just through the volume, then we'll make sure that we make them available, the answers available to you after the uh, event. Um, so rest assured, we will get to them all. 
before I introduce the next uh, panel, um, we've, um, we've obviously put together a, 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 a wonderful menu for you. The chefs can't say that I actually lent a, lent a hand, but uh, the chefs have put together a wonderful menu for you um, post the event. And uh, we thought it would be nice to hear from a couple of the suppliers uh, and to look at some of their, uh, their approaches to, um, to farming in a more sustainable way. So we have uh, Hammond's Farm and we have um, Chalk Stream Trout Farm, which shouldn't uh, trouble the tongue, but uh, has troubled my tongue every time I've tried to say it. So anyway, um, have a listen to those guys, and, uh, and then we'll, I'll introduce you to the next panel. We're growing a range of field scale vegetables, carrots, parsnips, a range of brassicas, including spring green, sweetheart cabbage, savoy, red and green kale, as well as some slightly off the wall crops like rhubarb and squash. We're, we're stood in a field of, uh, of coloured carrots, so the ones we're here now are, are purple. The purple ones that we're in right now are a variety called purple haze that are uh, purple on the outside and orange in the middle. So there's about a thousand tons of coloured carrots in this, uh, in this field. We've got over 30 miles of hedgerow on the farm. We're replanting hedgerows where they, um, they've been damaged. We're planting hedgerow trees. To start right at the bottom of the, of the food chain, we've got pollen and nectar mixes uh, to attract invertebrates that in turn attract small birds and small mammals that then in turn attract the larger predators and we're creating a fantastic micro ecosystem. Last bird count we had by the RSPB, we had just over 80 species of farmland bird, 10 of which were on the endangered list. So we're absolutely delighted with where we've managed to get our environmental credentials to. All our farms are on chalk streams uh, and they're on old mill sites and they take a great weight of water through the farms. So we have high flow, uh, gravity fed farms um, that are producing amazing lean, clean, freshwater trout. We've got very strict criteria and we're tested independently all the time to make sure that we meet those criteria. And we're always looking ourselves at ways that we can make sure that we're improving everything because we rely completely on that incredible water and we need to know that we are looking after it. So fish are the most efficient converters of food of all the animals produced for consumption. And rainbow trout are the most efficient farm fish. Food miles are a really critical part of our story. Um, we harvest here on farm, we process uh, half a mile up the road. We estimate 95% of our fish are eaten in England and a good proportion of that will be within 150 to 200 miles from here. The quality of the food and the quality of the husbandry on the farm is critical because that means that we can get really good food conversion rates here. Uh, the better the food conversion rate, the less food is wasted and the less fish waste is created. So that's a really important part of what we think is a really important part of our story. One of the advantages of having a farm on a high flow river system is that you are using gravity. So we're not relying on additional power to drive water through the farms. All our fish are produced to RSPC assured standards. Um, and what we try and create here is river conditions. So give them as close to the river environment as we can to produce a really lean, clean, fish in as natural environments as we can provide for them. We've had an incredible response from right across the food service market to the quality of what we're doing and the story that we can offer behind it and particularly the sustainability. And we're delighted to be part of Compass's climate net zero commitment. Okay, so you'll be able to taste those uh, vegetables and fish uh, later on. Um, so, on to the, uh, the next panel. I'm going to invite um, Joy uh, Lodico to come and, uh, and host the panel and moderate it for us. Uh, Joy is a, a Financial Times journalist. Come on, come on, uh, come on board, everybody. Uh, is a Financial Times journalist and who has written uh, on the environment many times. Um, and we're going to be talking about how we make our meals more sustainable. And I'll let Joy and the panel introduce themselves when they arrive. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. And um, this discussion is on eating green, how to make our meals more sustainable. Um, now, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, they come from every perspective, from the ground up, from sourcing through to <coughs> cooking, to somebody who takes a, a wider view, a global view on climate change and business. Um, so could I start with, can I start with you, Ryan? Lovely. 
Uh, I'm Ryan Holmes. I'm the culinary director for Compass Group Business and Industry Division. Hi, Nicola Weir. Um, I am the director of internal sustainability at Deloitte. I've just actually moved back from Nepal, where um, the cow is sacred there. So I've got you know, a, a head start on not eating beef at the moment. So that's quite good. I'm Christian Paynton. I'm from the United Fresh Consortium. We're a group of some of the country's best regional suppliers operating a green model of national supply. Um, of working very closely with the sustainable models and ensuring that the reduction of food miles within the entire supply chain. Now, the, qu the question is not actually such a straightforward one because we can't necessarily, we don't necessarily agree externally on what the idea of sustainability is. There are divided opinions within that group. Would you, Nicola? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I'm from a company of um, over 75% millennials who uh, very much express the, their opinions. Um, I, we're dealing with you know, 16,000 people in the UK, 50,000 people across Europe. Um, and I will have a discussion one day around you know, bagged salad and whether that is more sustainable than beef. Um, for those of you who don't know, we throw away in the UK 40% of all bagged salad, so it's fairly disgraceful. But having these discussions on a daily basis is, 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 is fascinating because it forces you to have the dialogue. It forces us to have the dialogue with our suppliers as well. Um, and what, what we're seeing is um, a real drive towards more education around um, food types and sustainable meals. So you'll, we're seeing a, a real influx of new apps coming through. Some of you will have heard of Olio, which we'll talk about probably a bit later. Um, we've got a partnership with Geeky Earth, who are all around um, creating awareness through products. You can scan um, a product now and get more awareness. So our people are coming, proactively coming to us saying, what are you doing? Um, and for me, I think one of the key things around this fragmented opinion is just lack of awareness. Um, so, you know, we just don't, there, is, there are no standards out there at the moment. And one of the exciting things I'm looking at is um, around food labeling. I know Ryan's also looking at similar things, but, you know, as we work together as an ecosystem with UK Gov setting the regulations, the likes of Deloitte coming to the table helping your big supermarkets, Compass Group getting in there, we can start to invest and we can start to create more and more awareness for, for our consumers and then allow them to make better decisions. Okay, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, labelling systems later and education in the next few minutes. But uh, you mentioned the kind of the government plan. Um, Christian, I wonder whether you have a view on this. I think often the answer to a problem is to say, well, the government must mandate this and go the government must make us do such and such. Um, with no disrespect to Andrew Griffith, so there's nothing particularly wrong with the plan. But there does come a little bit of a problem when it feels like a kind of top-down solution being imposed on people to tell them to eat their greens. I think we, uh, we see that just from the things that have happened more recently with COVID and guidance that's come down from government, there's a backlash from the public about whether you're to wear masks, not wear masks, make changes, not. Our opinion, my opinion, is very much that whilst it's important that government lays, lays out their position, we as an industry should drive um, all of us, whatever you think of as a client, should be driving sustainability through our businesses and not waiting for our clients to ask us what the, what the answer to their next question is. It's important, as I say, that we're given guidance by the government, but, but we as a business spend an awful lot of time working with our supply base, ensuring that we have the answers to our own questions already ahead of this, so that we're leading into the future. If, if I look at our, if I might, if I look at our business going forward, sustainability and the efforts that we put into our own supply chain, first and foremost, are, are to benefit our own business and our future, then our clients after that. Would you, would you be able to give me an example of something you've done? Absolutely. It, we supply fresh produce across the whole of the United Kingdom um, and the Republic of Ireland. And we, we utilize a model of regional supply. So we're utilizing supply from farmers within Great Britain. But you know, there's a, I, I almost smile when I say bananas will still come from where they come from. Pineapples will still come from where they come from. With a greater need of understanding within the public and within our client base of, of what is coming from where and when. And education, dare I bring in that word again, um, from the client base we can then um, ensure that our customers are using seasonal produce. We work with 
Um, I've, I've got two great examples that we work with right now, a dairy business, BV, in the south, and a company called Particularly Good Potatoes in the north. And they, Particularly Good and BV, have both managed waste out of their businesses completely, therefore completely recycling all of their waste product, whether it's being utilised in feed uh, for animals nearby. They have all cleared water, so they completely recycle the water that is used, so that goes into irrigation. And then the other step forward that they've all taken, or both taken, is to reduce the radius that they're getting raw materials from. By the end of next year, BV will have reduced their carbon footprint by 60%. And our friends in the north supplying potatoes can drill down to the field that the crop was... Um, excuse me, that the crop was actually harvested from, so that when we actually go back through looking at traceability, we can take it literally back to the field behind the, behind the store. Christian, uh, sorry, but I do apologize. Ryan, as a chef, you're essentially taking on kind of Nicola's point about there are divided opinions, and the food you serve, you know, as well as being sort of practically on the plate, there are some various theories behind how you begin to, can begin to change the system. Um, are you essentially kind of nudging people to a, a different uh, way of eating? Absolutely. I think Nicola and Christian have both touched on it. It's all about education. <clears throat> um, for us, that's really important. We're not just educating our clients, we're educating our consumers, and we're also educating our chefs. We have to educate those uh, three different uh, people in order to get this you know, sustainability at the forefront of what we do. Uh, the nudging technique is something that we, we, we do in our business. Um, nobody likes to be dictated to, do they? Normally, if you get dictated to, you normally rebel. We're a nation that likes to do that. Therefore, using the nudging technique uh, really helps push kind of uh, plant forward, uh, plant-based dishes within our menus, by just doing it in real subtle ways. So we don't label um, vegan food vegan. Mm. We just take the word and off. We don't label it vegetarian. We don't label things plant-based, we take it away and we let the consumer make that choice. And we just put things in the right places. So we would put the plant-based dishes at the front of a counter, say, in a, in a workplace environment. We put the meat further away. Uh, and then the behavioral science, um, the consumers make that choice for us. We've, and, we've done a lot of that work. And what have you discovered from doing that? They make better choices. So um, for example, we've got a manufacturing contract uh, and through the pandemic, they've been very busy, very operational. And by making those choices, the plant-based dishes and the healthier choices have become the most popular items on the menu by making those clever switches. Go on, just tell me the dish. <laughs> Multiple dishes, and we've got lots of dishes in the range. And the important thing with our um, plant-based concept, Plantilicious, it's there with purpose. We don't put dishes on a menu to tick a box. Mm -hmm. We put them there because they're purposeful. So they will contain the right amount of protein that you need. They'll contain enough fibre in that dish, and at least two of your five a day. So it's not about, you know, back in the day, a, a cheesy pasta on the end of a counter. These are really good dishes. Okay, I'm going to drag a recipe out of you before we finish this. Um, we have, uh, we've, we, you've all mentioned education separately. Um, and I think this might be the point at which we try and talk about food labelling and how you can actually convey um, what the values behind that, the production of food is. Now, there are sort of various things we can talk about. We can talk about sourcing. We can talk about uh, the carbon uh, used in the production of the food, um, and I mean, what do you think? Is, what do you think is the most important bit of labelling, and how do you convey what's going on? Do you want to start, Nicola? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really complex. Um, I think um, you know, my dream is you know to to go to when we go to the canteen to be able to look at a packaging and just as I would look at calories to be able to see my sustainability impact through the food I'm eating as well. And I think we're going to see this very, very quickly. Um, I think the hardest thing actually is just the data. It, we're just not there yet because it's so complicated. Um, as you just touched on, it's, it's the sourcing, it's sustainable livelihoods, it's the use of water, it's transportation. Um, so to get data that's rich enough and, and um, and quality based to add trust to the consumer is really hard. So we're not there yet. We're not there, but we're on the journey. And, and people are, you know, through the through the through ecosystems, you're seeing this collective. You're seeing startups like um, Foundation Earth and, and and Cool Eats coming through and, and really driving Oxford University. I think are here today, and they're really pushing this. So it's really it's exciting to see it moving quickly. 
Christian, what do you think on the matter of sourcing? Do you feel like you, that gives uh, the consumer an ac accurate picture of what they are doing? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're strong advocates for a, a sourcing guide that uses a, a sustainability score. Um, so I, I use my favourite air freighted December strawberry that's been flown in, probably tastes lovely. Um, however, should be scoring minus 10 on the scale. And when a menu is being produced and the chef is sitting down, he's measuring his entire menu based on the sustainability score. Um, and maybe that will help him with his choices. Maybe that will help them with their planning. Because we've worked very hard in this country over the last years to ensure that product that is supplied, sorry, is grown in this country and therefore supplied out. And a lot of um, ingenious changes have happened, things like LED um, growing methods that you'll all be seeing in trials going on in the underground in London, um, mm -hmm. these methods that you've seen coming through. Um, but those are actually now filtering through into the mainstream. So something like the humble strawberry, um, that we're right in the middle of a fantastic season right now, and this weather today is only going to sweeten that fruit right as we speak. The strawberry um, season has been extended by LED um, technology. So we have that for a much longer period of time. So it's less difficult to plan key items out of a menu or into a menu. We as a business for quite a long time now have worked with our clients to remove air freight items where they're unnecessary. Um, certainly in education settings, we, we have some clients who have completely removed air freighted produce um, and, and we can work with them. The key goes back to full education and I, I know I'm, I'm not turning to the right in case I get stopped. But we, we again work very heavily with really young people who, who might be interested in catering right down to primary school level. Our supply partners are, are out offering what we term as vegetation. So there's understanding within really young people who don't always get to see the produce like we see it or understand it to the degree that maybe we as younger people didn't get to see it at that time. Um, and, and that then filters through from primary to secondary and to young chefs and to chef mentoring schemes that we, we support heavily as well. Um, Christian, one other question. I think we often talk about local and seasonal. Is it always correct that local is going to be better than from somewhere else? Again, it's a question of divided opinion. We can always say vegan, vegan food is wonderful, plant-based food is wonderful. Is that always the correct answer? I think when you say local, seasonal and better, yeah. an Egyptian strawberry is probably very tasty, as is, as is a strawberry from Kent or from the Cheddar Gorge. The, the issue for us becomes when it's put in an aeroplane in a box that's not in sustainable packaging, not handled in the right way, and you cannot, you cannot look over where the methods are being and how they're farming, um, and that can't be traced back. Whereas the, the fantastic suppliers that we're utilising in this country and people like Ryan are insisting that we, we provide traceability information on, um, we can go back and we can look at their methods and we can ensure that all of the efforts that they're employing I heard only this week about one of our suppliers who's changing their, their tractors so their impact on the land as they move across the land is lessened and then there's a greater efficiency of how they move. Minor, minor changes possibly in the use of fuel and, and different things, but these things are all adding up to an improvement. Okay. Um, it, just to remind the audience, uh, both live in the room and online, you can please feed through some questions and I will put them to the panel as well. Um, Ryan, you, when these, when these foods arrive, what sort of labelling do you want to see on them? What are the, what are the key things that will trigger a decision in, uh, you know, it, to, to choose one particular supplier? In terms of consumer? In terms labor? of, yeah. It, in, again, it needs to go back to what I said before. It needs to nudge people to make the right decisions so that they're, they're purchasing something mm -hmm. that's going to have benefit to the environment. And I think if we take that subtle approach, it will make a, a massive difference. I mean, within our business, we're trialling the leap um, eco labeling in partnership with the Oxford University. We've got some great feedback on, on doing that. We're really seeing that change, coupled with changing the wording on menus, making it more enticing, making you know vegetables the hero on there. And then regardless, food, great taste in food is what people choose. Um, but we're finding that putting that, the, the eco labeling on there, people are making that choice by themselves. What will I see if I am looking for an eco label? Uh, you'll, see, uh, you'll see great British produce mm -hmm. uh, at the top uh, of the menu, so that's really showcased. You'll see it on the menu tonight, uh, where we've got kind of the choices that are the really sustainable are up at the top. And then you look at maybe a, a beef dish, which would be maybe um, graded 
any, but what we're trying to do is reduce the size of the beef on that, increase the vegetables so it hits two or five a day, add some fibre in there so it becomes a real balanced dish. Okay, so this, you're adapting the menu very subtly without necessarily... Absolutely, Okay. Yeah. And do you get feedback from your customers? I mean, do, what, what, com what comes back when All you do time. this? Um, lots of positive messages mm. um, in, in a kind of manufacturing environment. They want to eat lots of meat. You know, that's what they, they you know, they, they work very long hours. Uh, they're on the floor a lot, so they want to kind of eat a lot of protein, a lot of meat. So we try and, again, the subtle nudging approach, we'll adapt it in different ways. So we'll make a, a bolognese, for example, and it'll be half meat, half vegetables, and which is very clever on how we do that. So we blitz up the vegetables uh, and then cook it in that way, add it in so it bulks the dish out. They might not necessarily know. Sometimes afterwards, they'll compliment the chef on a fantastic meal, and then we might drop it in afterwards that, you know what, you've got two or five a day and you've, we've halved your, your kind of beef consumption in there. You've touched on a very interesting question of um, the status of meat as the sort of t top level of the diet, which we may just come back, back to a little bit later. The last thing I'd like to touch on is if we are talking about sustainability, and Nicola has raised this already, um, it is also about what happens to the food that doesn't get eaten in your fridge. Yeah, I mean, I, coming from the development sector back to the UK, I was astounded by the, the extent of food waste in this country. Um, I think I was, I was doing some research for the panel, and it, the numbers are that we use 65 billion litres of water on potatoes that we throw in the bin. We spend a trillion dollars on food that's wasted. You know, the numbers are just frightening. And so, you know, together as, you know, we, we represent each, you know, from a, from a large corporate consumer, compass, and then, and then the food manufacturer, uh, food, food growers, we've got to all force this change in the system and change consumer, educate people, change the processes. Um, I've been really impressed with UK Gov have got an initiative around step up to the plate, trying to get big organisations, of which Compass is one of them, to half food waste. Um, again, new apps coming through to encourage that individual um, sharing of food and, and different resources. So it, it, for me, it's frightening, and we've got to really start to focus on it. OK. And um, we've got a question which is almost after my own heart, because I gave up, giving, gave up eating avocados about two years ago. What is more sustainable, an avocado or a locally reared steak? How do we tell the whole story? Input, input use, food miles, nutritional value, social impact. Uh, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the veg man, to start off with, not the butcher. Um, again, it comes back to the education of us all throughout the supply chain, um, the understanding of, of what it requires to bring a product across from wherever we need it or wherever we want it. We are always going to need product, and we are also go always going to need fruit and vegetables that come from all corners of the earth. The important thing is in that understanding of what it is that, that it takes to get that to our door. I don't have the answer specifically to that question, but it is, you know, asking ourselves these important questions will, will eventually educate us as a broader group and, and, and ensure that we're actually making the right decisions and answers. Ryan, the avocado <laughs> or the locally reared steak? The locally reared steak, because you know what we're trying to do, what Carolyn uh, said very well, we're not taking beef and meat completely out of our, our, our net zero target. We're just reducing the consumption. Therefore, if we can improve the animal welfare and we can get a great locally reared, grass-fed you know, bit of steak on the menu, fantastic. We're just going to reduce the portion, portion size slightly. We're going to make sure you've got two of your five a day and some other uh, ingredients in there to make it a real balanced dish. Whereas the avocado... You know, if we, we wouldn't get it air freight, it would come via road, possibly from Italy, and try and do it that way. It's still sustainable in another way, but we want to promote British food, don't we, in season. That's the most important thing. Okay. The, 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 the other question we haven't really touched on is, um, is, which was mentioned earlier, is inequality. So if we are trying to feed a nation, everybody must have access at least to some meat, I think we've agreed. Um, However, there is also a kind of price sensitivity if food takes up a large part of your budget. How do you, how do you negotiate that particular problem? It comes back to what we've said all the way along. It's education. You can eat a good plate of food, a healthy plate of food, done in a sustainable way um, on a budget. Um, we, we've proved that it's, it's feasible. We just need to educate um, 
people at home. We need to educate our, our chefs to be able to help people cook in that way. It's so important. Rather than going and, and buying a processed uh, meal, which isn't very good for you, we're not built to eat processed food, therefore it's going to be detrimental to our health in the future. It's, we've got to get the nation eating you know, proper fruit and vegetables all the time. From your background in development, how do you think the inequality in the British food systems play out? I think it's just different diets. I think we're such a consumerist society and we've got so much more choice. Um, you know, if I take an environment like Nepal, you know, the, the basic is dal, rice, vegetables, and you eat that twice a day. Um, and the, and the, the choice of processed food is just not there. Um, so I think, it, it, again, it's complex, but there's, there's much more emphasis on how we used to be on, on grow your own, eat local, exchange in the community. Um, and I do see a shift towards moving back to that. I mean, even walking down you know, the streets of London, you're seeing more organic shops appearing and, and this, this idea of you know, your local fruit and veg seller. You know, don't buy bagged uh, lettuce. Go and buy an, an iceberg from your, from your local corner, corner shop, a fruit and veg man. Um, go to your local butcher, ask them where the beef is coming from, because it's, it's that consumer choice that's going to drive the change ultimately. And Christian, do you feel like supermarkets are responding adequately to these, to both the pressures of needing to be sustainable, but also the need to fill up people's cupboards at a price that uh, is acceptable? We all of us in our businesses are led by the consumer, ultimately, because they ask, we fulfill a need. Um, I feel personally that the supermarkets don't go as far as they could do with sustainable produce. I feel that the supermarkets are led by, without a doubt, the figures and, and what people are wanting at the moment in time. We keep coming back to the same, same point. Um, you know, when I talk about us spending time in schools, us spending time with, with younger people, educating so that that then filters through, that will only happen over time. And when we get the consumer maybe wanting to change and understanding what, what is possible, then those demands can be filtered through to the supermarket because they will respond. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, we're gonna close the session in a couple of minutes. Could you, do you, what would that one takeaway be of that kind of key thing that you've learned during your career that has actually created change rather than just, you know, we know the theory. What's that, what's, that, what's that nudge that actually changed something? Be adaptable. We're, this is a, we're in an industry that evolves all the time. And if you say, stay stagnant and stay the same, everything will bypass you. You know, who would have thought 10, 20 years ago, we'd be talking, sat on the stage talking about kind of net zero and, and our, our big, bold claims that we're going to hit, you know, 2030. So be adaptable. Okay. Nicola. You, you have a range of expertises, but what is that thing that you actually feel that's happened so far or you're involved in or you know about that has actually made kind of a kind of key difference in progressing this story? I think the, the younger generation's coming through because it's, they, they have an opinion and they are shouting about it. Um, and so the, the conversation is driving the education, which is driving the, the leadership. So. Do you not think there might be a little bit of a kickback from the older generation who are used to eating in a different way? You see it, but I think it's, you're in the, like, you, you, you stand out now if, if you're so, you know, to, to one extreme. I think many people have kids who, you know, who, their kids are telling, you know, my, my seven-year-old turned vegetarian, you know, at seven. So, you, you know, the pressure is on older generations to change. I, I have a vegan child. I, I understand. <laughs> I do. I'm not allowed to eat meat in front of them. Um, Christian, in your experience, perhaps either with producers or with who you sell to or how the, how the consortium works, again, what's that kind of key thing that's just unlocked something as a change? The first thing we must remember is everything is possible. Mm. We, I talk about my own experiences, of course. We, we put a business together back 14 years ago driving a green agenda because we genuinely believed that there was another way to great big warehouses in the middle of the country, moving product up and down the country. Um, there had to be a better way that not only satisfied from a service perspective, but my business partner, Noel Kershaw, and I genuinely believed in reduction of food miles, the carbon footprint. Remember, 14 years ago was, was pre-credit crunch, was, was pre the, the financial difficulties. 
So we were driving a business at that point that was, okay, of its time, I would argue, but then was looking to some choppy waters ahead of it because of what was coming. But everything is possible by, by driving an agenda with, 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 with key clients and then making that happen through hard work. So with our, sorry, but with our, with our will to open up some really fantastic UK producers to the marketplace by being different, we, we, we believe we've enabled that in a small way. Okay, so essentially tra transport changes, listening to the younger generation and being adaptable and presumably allow, ex expecting customers themselves to be adapted. Great. Okay, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your time and I hope the audiences have come away with some, both some practical ideas as well as some sort of theoretical ideas about how to change everything. So huge thank you to, uh, to Ryan, to Nicola and to Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you, Joy, as well, for uh, bringing all those uh, interesting points out of the panellists. I thought it was a really interesting discussion and uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, so thank you to you all. Um, so next, um, we're going to hear from a very uh, eminent speaker, uh, Professor Sir Charles Godfrey, uh, who's going to talk about feeding a growing population in a healthy and sustainable way. Uh, Sir Charles is a population biologist, um, with a, uh, a background in science and policy and how the two come together. Uh, career at uh, Oxford University and Imperial College, director of the, Martin, the Oxford Martin School and professor of population biology at Oxford. Um, previously chaired the UK Government Office of Sciences project on the future of food and farming. And I'm hoping he's gonna stay behind for a couple of questions from the audience as well. Um, but over to you, thank you. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here for two reasons. First of all, as you've heard from a number of the earlier speakers, uh, Compass really is uh, a real active force in the corporate world for sustainability. And secondly, as Ryan said, we in Oxford have been working with Compass on exploring a variety of behavioral interventions and menus and placement of food and things. It's been a joy to work with Ryan and his colleagues. We are very grateful. Now, those of you who are uh, observers of Chris, the wonderful Chris Whitty and Patrick Balance will know that our scientists can't get up without a slide deck. So could I have the first slide, please? Thanks very much. And uh, I can do it here. So um, let me start by looking back before looking forward. And I think there have been three periods over the last couple of hundred years where we have really worried about food. And the first was at the end of the 18th century when the brilliant, if slightly dyspeptic, dyspeptic British vicar and founder, one of the founders of Economists, uh, Thomas Malthus, argued that population was growing so fast compared with agricultural production, there would be major famines in the first part of the 19th century. And he was wrong, and he was wrong because of the constellation of advances associated with the Industrial Revolution. And then I'm old enough to remember the second time when we were really worrying about food, in the 70s and early 80s, the time of the population bomb, the time of the Club of Rome, when people like Paul Ehrlich were predicting by, that by the end of the 20th century, we'll be having food riots in Europe and democracy threatened. And they were wrong, and they were wrong because of the Green Revolution, the wonderful advances in genetics and associated technologies in agriculture. And I think we're going through a third period of what I call Malthusian pessimism at the moment. I think it started with a financial crisis in, in 2008 and the hike in food prices, global food prices, a few years later. And it continues today as we worry about the effect of climate change and other environmental st stresses on our ability to uh, feed the world. And so the big question is, which I'll try and answer at the end, is uh, is there another revolution that's going to get us out of it? Now, the type of things we do in, when we study food systems in academia is to try and explore both the threats ahead and the potential solutions. In the next two slides, I'm just going to give two examples of analysis we've done in Oxford. And the first one says, let us suppose that we've decarbonized everything, transport, energy, heating, apart from the food system. 
and we continue with the food system business as usual. And what that says is that the food system alone will push us over 1.5 and push us up towards 2 degree. So we just have to do something about the food system. And just concentrating on the food system, where are most of the, um, of the greenhouse gas emissions coming from? Well, they're coming from across the whole food system, but we can't get away from the fact that animal products, and particularly ruminants, are really important. Now, of course, all these analyses might be wrong. It might be that we get wonderful technological inventions that are get out of jail cards. But do you really think that's true when you look at the number of analyses, when you look at what is happening when we see the heat waves in North America, the horrible floods in Europe at the moment, which we can begin to technically attribute to climate change? There really will be action, and the food system must be part of it. And looking ahead at the coming challenges. Demand for food will go up. There will be more people on Earth, and they will be richer. Now, there is good news there. The rate of population growth is uh, decelerating. Malthus argued that population growth will increase until it inexorably will uh, outpace agricultural supply. There would inevitably be hunger. Today, we are the first generation that can really say there is an intellectual argument against Malthus. Through the demographic tr transition, bring people out of poverty, educate kids, especially girls. Populations globally will come around. My background, my academic background, is in population biology. I am more cheerful in my early 60s than when I was a student. We have hunger and undernutrition. Diane mentioned hunger. Hunger is going up. Interestingly, it's going up because of increase in uh, conflict, both within states and across states, which is outside the food system. It's still a disaster, but there has been good news on hunger. We met the Millennium uh, Development Goal. But then we have pressures on agriculture, water scarcity, competition for land and soil, and more frequent shocks, and those shocks are uh, climate change, geopolitical, I should have added epidemic shocks there as well. So what do we need to do? Well, the issue is both hugely complex and hugely simple. It's complex because I'd argue that the magnitude of the challenge ahead is such that we do not have the luxury of not acting on any particular front. We just have to try and do our best across all fronts. We have to have these difficult conversations about, um, about modifying our diets so that we eat fewer of the food types that cause the most environmental harm and fewer of the food types that make us unhealthy. We have to produce more food from the existing agricultural footprint. So we have to, what I call, sustainably intensify. We have, to have, we have to talk about waste, and as Joy mentioned, it's appalling the amount of food we waste, but waste is complex as well. For example, in tropical countries, you can reduce the amount of waste by putting in um, coal chains. Those coal chains have greenhouse gas uh, emissions. There is some waste that makes economic sense. So we need to bear down at waste, but not assume again that it is a get out of jail card. And we need to improve food governance. And that covers a magnitude of different things. And I'll just mention one here. Um, and this is the resilience of the global food chain. We move food around the world, and we have to. Imagine you're the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Food in um, Egypt. You're not going to feed a population of 90 million rising to 150 million in 30 years from the strip of land along the Nile. You're going to have to Im import food from elsewhere, for con from countries such as in South America, which have a food surplus. We need to ensure that that food system, that global commodity trade, which works very well, but we need to make certain it's resilient. We need to ask the questions of it now that we wish we had asked the banks in two 2000. And of course, the answer may be positive, but we really need to, to, to do that. What can we do in the UK? Well, to repeat what I said, we need to get serious about diets. We need to have a better narrative about diets. 
When the National Food Strategy was published last week, and Anna Taylor had a large part in that, you'll hear from her in, in the next panel, it was disappointing that some of the tropes that came out about nanny states, about, um, about interfering with hardworking people. We need to have a more positive narrative about what diet change uh, can do. We've had some great discussion about nudges and labeling, and I'm hugely in favor on that. But there is now good academic research, as well as, to be honest, just basic common sense, that, that although that is all good, it will not cause sufficient change at the scale that we need. We need other things as well. We need governments to um, intervene, both fiscally and regulatory. And we need them to have the courage to do that. But it's not sufficient just to blame politicians for not acting. We as individuals in civil society have to give them the, the political license to do that. And the private sector in particular, I think, has a real role in arguing that, um, that uh, regulatory and fiscal changes isn't always bad. And it is nice to see that Compass has been out there. And finally, I worry that when the private sector is doing the right thing, often it doesn't get sufficient credit for that because it's not trusted enough. And there's also some greenwashing, but I worry more about not getting the right credit for doing it. And I think it's, part, it's a role for my world to produce the data informatics and the transparency so that it is much easier to actually demonstrate that you're doing uh, the right thing. And that wonderful example of avocados versus steak, well, as an academic, I can give you the answer. It depends. You can grow steak and avocado in very different ways, and we need to be able to capture that. And we need new thinking about food production. In this country, we need the land to sequester carbon, to promote biodiversity, and to provide food as well. I don't think we realize as a country just how much land use in this country needs to change over the next couple of decades to make our, um, to make our uh, commitments. And we need to invest in R&D, and trade must be part of the answer. I'll go rapidly to the last slide, as Carolyn threatened me with terrible violence if I went over. <laughs> So the conclusion to the question I had at the end is, yes, we do need a, a, a revolution. And this is a double green revolution. So, or even a triple green revolution, because it's a revolution in producing more food and doing it more sustainably. And that revolution must also be on the consumer as well as the production side. And let me just go back to what I said. Are all these models and projections wrong? It really is very unlikely. I do believe that those countries, that, that those companies that um, embrace this agenda now, get ahead of get ahead of history, are going to be are going to really profit profit in the long term. And I just, just finished that. I really am an optimist. I, I think we can do this. We can feed the world, and we can do it sustainably healthily and equitably. And several people brought up the equity issue, which I've only touched on. It's really important. But my background's in the environment. And so I speak often to people interested in biodiversity and things. And I speak to people who are interested in human rights. I speak to people in, in all sorts of things. And essentially, whatever you're interested in, whatever is your priority, if we fail on food, we fail on that as well. Forgive me for going over 30 seconds. I'm going to take you a few more minutes over your 30 seconds, if that's OK uh, with Carolyn. Uh, so a couple of questions that have just come through while, while you're speaking. Um, I think we'll take them sort of in reverse order. So from your perspective, when you look internationally, um, are any countries on this journey particularly well, doing something particularly well? Are there any pockets of countries or individual countries that are ahead of the journey here? Um, well, let me pos be positive about the UK. I think, and uh, one of the previous speakers, I think it was Nicola, mentioned this, um, that I think we're doing pretty good on food waste. So RAP is a wonderful organization, and I think we're up there with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Netherlands, as another good example. 
Um, I think we are um, a really great country on some of the research and investment we need, for example, in plant breeding and things. So I think we're doing very well on that. Um, I think we're doing pretty badly on um, diets. Um, I think you'd need to go and look at a country such as Finland for some of the things they've brought in for some really interesting examples of how you can approach, uh, uh, how you can approach some of the issues around uh, obesity and things. OK, great. I'm um, quick whiz around the globe there. And then um, finally, um, although we said we wouldn't do this, uh, there is a question, so we can ask this question. In terms of the government role, uh, in this journey. How do you see that? Well, I, I wish government would be braver, but I also have sympathy for, for government. Uh, I don't often quote Jean-Claude Juncker, but he did once say, well, often we know what we need to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected once we've done it. <laughs> and I think that it throws it back to us, that uh, us both as individuals and people like you as leaders of, of industry, to change the mood music within which we are discussing some of these issues, to make it more permissive, to make the hard decisions that the smart politicians know have to be made. OK, I think that's wonderful insight. Thank you very much. Very Thank grateful. You. So um, that, was, uh, that was terrifically interesting. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, our final panel uh, before, we, before we close. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Lewis Iwu to, uh, to moderate and host this for us. So whilst, whilst the, um, the panelists are, are joining Lewis on the stage, Lewis is the founding partner of Purpose Union, which is a, uh, a purpose strategy organization work with public and private bodies and on environmental campaigns. And, um, and the panel are going to discuss how we feed the fight against climate change and how we transform our food systems quickly and fairly. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, on Sunday, many of you may have seen uh, some clubbers in the early hours celebrating Freedom Day really early on. I'm glad to see that we tried to recreate some of that atmosphere so you don't feel left out. Twinkly lights uh, to recreate the scene, the potential of meeting future partners and cocktails as well. But before we do that, um, we are going to talk about transformation and what needs to happen and what needs to change. We've got a fantastic panel joined by Anna, Christina, Emma and Carolyn, who will introduce themselves in a moment. And the focus for this session really is about how can we transform our food system and crucially, quickly and fairly. And is there a tension between the two? Um, so I'm going to uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves and the work that they do, but answer the question and give their opening thoughts on this. How can we transform our food system in a way that sort of meets those two requirements quickly and fairly? And I want to start with Anna. Um, Executive Director of the Food Foundation. Great to be here. So quickly and fairly. Um, speed. I think uh, some, some points which Charles made about uh, the length of time that it's taken for us to get to this point where we have a food system which is currently coming at great cost to the planet, to nature, to our, our, our climate, and also to our health. That's taken place, it's evolved over 70 or 80 years to be in the situation we're in now. So we have to be realistic that we've got to a point now where our diets are heavily dependent on foods which have this big footprint, whether it's on our health or our environment, and it's going to take us time to shift our diets. All the precedents, if you look at how fast it takes to change diets in other countries and other settings, it takes time. But I think um, what's interesting is what the levers are we have to make the change happen. Um, we've been talking today about the role that Compass is going to play and other businesses. And obviously, businesses can move pretty quickly. Um, and make changes happen. We've, we, do, we run a project called Peas Please, which is all about getting companies to serve more veg and sell more veg. And um, Tesco, over the space of a year, basically moved from having 25% of their ready meals with a portion of veg in to half of their ready meals, just in the space of a year. They can move really quickly when they want to move. 
When you've got government policy, of course, we had a series of recommendations that came out in the National Food Strategy last week, 14 recommendations. They're going to take time to get to the point where they are adopted by government. They go through consultation and testing and development and working out where they fit, et cetera, building public support. But then, of course, once those policies are in place, they can also make change happen quite quickly. We saw that with the sugary drinks tax. You know, within a very short period of time, tons of sugar was taken out of soft drinks and had a material impact on the amount of, that we're actually consuming. So, so I think that sort of role of business leading the way often in, for some businesses that are really progressive can make things happen quickly and you need then the policy frameworks to come in, create the level playing field and push everyone even further. In terms of fairness, um, or um, did you say fair, was that the, the word? Uh, qu fairness. Quickly and fairly, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think the challenge here is how we get to a point where um, healthy and sustainable diets are the, the most affordable and the easiest for everybody. Mm. That's when you make it fair for people, where you're not... Um, expecting people to spend more than they can afford in order to make those healthy and sustainable choices. And, and you're not expecting people to do the heavy lifting. And I'd actually perhaps say something different to quite a lot of the previous panel that puts a huge amount of emphasis on education as being the, the route out of this. I actually don't think that's the case. I think we need to shift the economics of the system quite fundamentally so that we, we don't require everybody to um, do the heavy lifting, but we make it easy for people. And that's vitally important if you've got the added constraints of very little money, a very tight budget, you might have rubbish cooking facilities at home, you might have poor cooking skills, though poor cooking skills, frankly, cut across whether you're rich or poor. Yep. Um, but the combined effects of all of those things and worrying how you're going to pay the next bills, you're not worrying about whether whether you're going buying the most nutritious thing for your child, you're thinking, I don't want to throw anything away and I want to make sure the kids eat this. I'm going to go for the thing which I know they eat. All of that combination of things means that you've got to start with rebalancing the economics of the system so that the healthy and sustainable is, is the most affordable. Thank you so much for that, Anna, and a bit of a provocation there as well. And, and by the way, just as a reminder, you all have access to Slido. So if you do sort of have views on that, the role of education, is it enough? Please uh, offer your views, ask any questions, or indeed on any other topic. I want to bring uh, Christina in, because uh, actually that's a great touch point. Christina, given your work, uh, your fantastic work on campaigning around the food system and issues of equity and fairness, especially for young people, again, what's your response to this? What, what worries you? What do we have to look out for in terms of this question about making this trans transformation done quickly, but fairly? I completely agree with everything Anna said. Uh, I'm Christina, co-chair of the Bite Back 2030 movement, which is a youth-led organization uh, aiming to half child obesity by 2030, another uh, target for that key date. And essentially, when, when we say, you know, all the stakeholders are in this room, I disagree. I'm the only young person here. We're the future, we've already discussed that. But even when you talk about young people, it's not about people like me. Uh, I'm from a working class background, didn't know anything about climate and food until I deliberately exposed myself to it. And so I kind of don't uh, think that, as you said, the issue lies in education. I think that there's no transparency at all with the food system, and I think that's one of the biggest problems. I didn't know anything about my diet. I still don't know a lot about my diet. 70% of young people's uh, diets are ultra-processed, 70%. That's not something we have control over. There are layers of issues. Um, advertisement, we are bombarded uh, with advertisements on our phones, uh, walking to school, that's, that's an issue in itself. We managed to get the um, ban a couple weeks ago, which is amazing, but still, that only comes into act in 2023. Uh, we've got food deserts. A lot of us still live in food deserts. A lot of us don't have the option of getting some healthy meals at an affordable price, getting some fruit and bread, veg on our way home. No, we're going to get chicken and chips on our way home because that's what's there for a pound. And so I think when we have this discussion, we have to be really um, aware of who's not in the room, who we're not talking to, 
um, and who we need to be including to ensure that we can do this fairly. In terms of quickly, <laughs> I don't know. I don't see it happening quickly. That's why it's a 10-year campaign, and even then, it will probably take longer to enact everything that uh, we want. But I'm really passionate about ensuring that everyone is included and that this is an issue about fairness and equality and equity rather than uh, rushing the process. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Emma, I want to bring you in uh, and, and to hear your thoughts about the state of the system and how we get that balance, but maybe specifically also responding to what Christina said about how do we make sure the right people, whether it's farmers, um, families on low incomes, young people, you know, people who might be uh, sort of impacted adversely by a carbon tax or by any other type of policy to help us transition. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? Thank you, Christina and Anna. If I was on Microsoft Teams, I'd have put my little thumbs up button on. This is, <laughs> this is new, being back in person. Absolutely. And I think we're all here because we know the food system is broken. We, yes, we are producing enough food to feed everyone. We're not getting it to the right places. We're wasting more than a third of it. And more than half the food we produce is literally costing the earth. We're seeing those impacts now, whether it's the massive heat waves across America, the forest fires, or it's the floods literally next door in Germany. Um, as well as the massive health impact that we know we're all facing. So absolutely, we know it's broken, we know we have to fix it. Uh, Nestle, we, uh, so I'm Emma Keller, I'm the head of sustainability at Nestle. I'm fairly new into post, so I joined the dark side from WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, which many of my peers said, why are you moving from the light side, essentially, to the dark side? And genuinely, it's because I really do believe that businesses are a force for good in this space. Nestle is the world's biggest food and beverage company. If we can't really take on this challenge head on and act on it, then who can? So it's absolutely critical that we're in the debate. And I think what's so exciting is that the race to zero is genuinely on. And I think the word is, is race. How do we get there quickly? So interesting hearing from Christina that 10 years feels like a lifetime away. And 10 years is a long time. But for many of us, we've been working that long. And that can go in a flash. So getting the change we need to see in the next decade is going to be quick. We need it to happen quickly. We need it to happen rapidly. So whether your deadline is 2030, 2040, or 2050, what we know is we have to move together. We have to move in a fair and equitable way. That means there are going to be winners and losers. How do we bring them along with us and ensure that it is an equitable system? So for, for me, I really see, in answer to your question and the exam question we're facing, how do we do this fairly and justly? I think there are five major shifts that we need to focus on. The first is really harnessing the regenerative potential of the world we live on. So that's massively transitioning our system, our food system, from being degenerative taking more from nature than it puts back to being regenerative, actually shifting our food production from being a net source of emissions to a net sink. It's absolutely possible. We know the solutions. We need to get there quickly. The second link to that is, of course, farming. We need to work with farmers. They know the land way better than any of us do. We need to understand what their challenges are, what they're facing. They're feeling climate change. They're on the front line. They're taking on all the risk, the climate risk, the pest risk, the supply risk. We need to work with them to ensure they're transitioning and do that in an equitable way. The third major shift is around the, the, the systems that we depend on. How do we move from single linear systems to more circular systems where someone's output is another's input, really harnessing the power of circularity and locality? I think the fourth, which we've heard a huge amount on, and it's great to see it front and center in Compass's strategy as well, is shifting what we eat, moving to more plant-based foods. There are about 200,000 edible species of plant on the planet. We eat about 200. And just three of those provide more than 50% of the calories globally. We've massively narrowed what we're eating. How do we harness those 200,000 species, bring them into our more exciting portfolios, and really, really diversify our plates, make them more colorful, make them more exciting? And then the fifth major shift, I think, is collaboration. It's such an overused word. We talk about collaboration all the time, but it's a really underutilized concept. So I'd love to see what we can get out of today. How do we really do business as unusual and get some of those innovative, radical collaborations to help us achieve some of these shifts. Thank you so much, Emma. And, and Carolyn, your, your reflections. Uh, thanks, Lewis. I, um, I guess, I think really, if we're brutally honest, 
what this boils down to is an ability to, as Anna touched on briefly, but rewiring the economics so that the environment that we need to be able to provide for people so that we can all act in a way that we need to is the easiest one and the one that's also affordable. I'm sure everyone has scars to prove this. I know that I do, but it doesn't matter how compelling the argument is or how, um, how Im impassioned uh, the case is advocated. If there is a financial barrier, then it is really difficult for that change to be made. So I think the question around speed is really intrinsically linked with the appetite that we have within all the organisations we work within to unlock the capital to allow us to escalate the changes that are needed. And if we think about all of the suppliers that we work with and all of the people, the millions of people that we are looking after, then it is really difficult to decouple this notion of and the importance of equality if we don't really understand um, how we go about acting as far as we can as almost like an inter a financial intermediary to try and change some of the ways in which the people that we need to work with are able to transition. It's a very different set of circumstances to transition as a global PLC or a, a subsidiary of that PLC than it is if you're working in uh, a smaller environment. And I think that's really important here, Lewis, when we talk about um, the speed and fairness of change is that if we remember back to the sustainable development goals and the importance of a just transition, it is impossible to have a just transition unless there is that collaboration between those that have the weight to be able to influence and also those that have the bravery to be able to really speak out and not be afraid to, uh, to do that in a really straight talking way. So I heartily applaud that and I think we just need more of that uh, getting straight to the heart of the things that, that need to change in order for all of the others uh, to be feasible. Thank you so much. And we've, and what's remarkable is how many questions sort of are very similar. Um, and actually, there's a lot of questions and points around this idea of education and choice and almost putting the onus on consumers when actually there's, there are more systemic forces at play. I just wanted to get your, your take and sort of feel free to chip in everyone. You know, are we using the idea of individual responsibility as an excuse, a get out of jail card, when actually we should be supporting government direct action, government subsidizing families more? Otherwise, we're just going to be in this constant loop of saying it's about people making choices, uh, helping people to support that choice, etc. When, as many of the questions have pointed out, we're seeing rising food poverty. Uh, maybe, sort of, Anna, you can come back into that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, w I was uh, very involved in the, the work with, on the National Food Strategy that was published last week, and there's a chapter in there called The Junk Food Cycle, and I would really urge, if you haven't read it, it doesn't take very long to read it, um, I would really urge people to read it, because what it does is it explains why the economics, why we've got into this situation where actually we cannot rely on education and willpower and exercise to get us out of this diet problem. And it explains that we're biologically made to go after energy dense foods that's in our makeup. And the food industry has responded to that and created these foods in abundance and marketed to them and been successful at selling them to us. And when we eat those foods, that breaks our, that it, it makes our appetite not function as well as it does with unprocessed whole foods because um, our appetite doesn't kick in as quickly and we end up eating more of them. And then it becomes this vicious cycle and explains that in quite some detail and explains how that junk food cycle has escalated like a kind of reinforcing feedback loop in the system, escalated over the last 70 years to the point where now half of our calories are coming from foods which are classified as high in fat, sugar and salt, many of which have a lot of meat in them as well. Um, uh, you talked about ultra-processed foods, so that's even higher for certain sub subgroup, subsets of the population. So. To expect that individuals can somehow successfully 
en masse fight against this system is just wildly unrealistic when you look at that story and the evidence which supports it. So I think, yeah, we've, we've definitely overemphasized individual responsibility. Yeah. Should we be empowering consumers to, to, to use their agency more? Yes, absolutely. Should we be teaching kids about food in school? Yes, of course. But let's not put all our eggs in that basket. So you'd want to see more government, act what type of government action would you like to see to get this that thing done quickly? What well, I mean, I, I think some of the things which were laid out last week are really important. Um, uh, a tax on sugar and salt will get us a really good way in terms of shifting some of the economics of the system, but at the same time subsidising really healthy food for disadvantaged families, whether that's through free school meals or um, school, fruit and veg in schools or fruit and veg vouchers, those kinds of things. So that's a package of trying to tip the tip the balance of the system, the economics, so that the healthy and sustainable become more affordable is, is really crucial. Brilliant. Um, Christina, I mean, again, individual choice, do you think, uh, is that an excuse used by governments, corporates to escape taking difficult actions to avoid the claims that they're being a nanny state? I mean, are you comfortable with having a nanny state if it means we, we sort of get to a more sustainable food system more quickly? Uh, two points. First one, I think we need to start moving away from the word choice. It does not illustrate the, the issue well at all. It's about option. Uh, young people don't have the option to eat healthily. And as Anna clearly stated, we need to make that the most readily available option. Um, and with the whole <laughs> nanny state thing, I, I think that with, uh, say, Jamie Oliver, for example, I absolutely love him and I love the work that he's done um, to help young people. but. Loads of people my, my age absolutely hate him. They think that he destroyed free school meals and that he took away all the sugar from their Ribenas <laughs> because there was no communication. There was no, it, it seemed like an attack on young people's culture and, and um, the, the mood wasn't right, if that makes sense. So I think that these government legislation is so important um, to invoke the change that we need, but there has to be a cultural shift with that. You can't just say, okay, this is what's gonna happen and that's it. You, you need to explain, but also bring them with you. Mm. Um, make young people involved in the conversation, involved in the process, and I think that's why Bite Back is so great, because we do that. We, we get young people um, in these rooms, in talking to people in positions of power. Um, my, my first, uh, panel event was actually with Anna Taylor at City Hall and so I think it's so so important to and I, I'm going to talk about this all the time to get young people involved and not just the Greta Thunbergs the the actual people that will be affected by this the people that don't have that are, are on free school meals the people that don't have healthy food um, available to them because their insight is, is what is what is necessary to make this go on faster. Thank you so much. We've got a question here, which I think is a really interesting question, which I want Caroline and Emma to feed into, uh, no pun intended. And uh, the question is this, what personal changes have the panel members made uh, in the sake of more sustainable food and what have they learned from it? So a very personal question about your choices and what you've learned from it, Emma. Yeah, I've definitely been on a journey and, and it's, it's always the thing, I know, I know too much about the food system, so I know what's going on and sometimes even I don't, I know I don't make the best choices because I'm doing what everybody else is doing, I'm rushing around, I'm just really hungry, I just want to grab what's available. So the biggest change that I've made is, I would say, I'm an environmentally conscious flexitarian. What does that mean in reality? So it means I have a flexitarian diet, so I don't exclude any food group outright because part of regenerative agriculture means we need animals within our system. Nature has animals within the system. They're absolutely key to fertilizing the land. They're, they're just sometimes the best option for what the land can produce. But we have, we, what we need to do is right size that system. That animal agriculture system has just exploded. It's just too big. So by being more flexitarian collectively, we can start to right size that system and use that land more sustainably, but animal agriculture can have a role. And then the environmentally conscious part is I make choices that for me are the ones that are more environmental, whether that's sourcing locally, which I try and do as much as possible. And I think through the pandemic, we've all seen that, we've all tried to do that more. I 
try and buy seasonally, all of those kind of key things. I cook from scratch much more often than I ever used to. Those are the key choices that I've made to, to, to embody the things that I try and advocate in my job as well. Helen, same question to you. Um, so two, two things um, from, uh, from, uh, from our house um, to answer the personal question. Um, I think it's often really easy and quite right that we focus on all of the really serious implications of making the changes. Um, but I also think if we remember back to the fact that food is uh, amazing, <laughs> incredible, delicious, um, it's really emotive and it can engage in a way that um, actually just talking about something is really tricky to do. Um, so one of the things that we try to do in our house is just talk a lot about where the food comes from, why that's interesting. Um, my brother's in Korea at the moment and uh, they eat a lot of kimchi. Um, the kids like a lot of ketchup. So let's try and understand uh, a little bit more about um, differences like that because through difference often it's really easy to, um, to emphasize a point. And I guess the other thing that I, I think is I guess back to the, the 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 kind of overall topic of you know where does the sort of where does a big part of the responsibility um, sit, and um, I think on the topic of the national food strategy, um, Anna, and if we think back to 2014 when the fizzy drinks levy was put in front of Jeremy Hunt, and how unthinkable it was, you know, it was it was completely like just not really something that uh, had sort of been explored in the same way um, before. And so I guess from, from my side, um, I feel that there's immense power in being able to uh, show how things that would be perceived as unthinkable uh, actually don't need to be. Um, and any radical transformation that has ever been has always had a vast majority of people look at those pushing it forward as if they're complete madmen. So um, it's just trying to stay very focused on the fact that we need to believe that this is possible and we need to support every single age group in whatever language that means to believing that to be the case too. Thank you so much. Fortunately, we're near the end of our session, um, but I'm going to ask the panelists in no less than 15 seconds each to come up with one lever, critical lever, that they think should be pulled to get that right balance between quick transformation but a fair one. So one very practical lever, it could be something that businesses do or governments do, um, or both. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Emma, first. Um, I'm going to say for all of us, for every stakeholder, the key thing we can do is just not waste not waste food, not waste energy, but most importantly, not waste time, not waste time waiting for the perfect data set or the perfect solution set. We know enough, we've got more data than we've ever had. Let's not waste time, let's crack on and, and let's get this done. Brilliant, Christine. Uh, mine will be transparency. Ensure that you're taking uh, the people that you wanna help along with you. Um, and remember that it's a st systemic change, not an individual one. Fantastic, Anna. I think since this is largely a kind of business audience, I definitely go for along the lines of the sort of animal to plant protein switch, which can be done very easily in lots of settings. There's tons of untapped opportunity for businesses to, to move the dial on that without and keeping everybody involved and it not having a big price impact. So go down that route first. Brilliant. Uh, mine would be, please tell us what you need. Um, in the spirit of us asking for help, which we will definitely, definitely be doing, how can we extend ours with the radical generosity that we've seen through various really inspiring uh, organisations? Thank you. You all kept to 15 seconds. Very impressed. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was uh, immensely interesting. And I think we had a bit of a debate there as well with the sort of big discussion about the role of education and indeed the role of choice architecture versus more government action. Uh, but thank you so much to the amazing panel.
Well, that was uh, st absolutely stimulating and gripping again uh, in terms of the panel discussion. Thank you, Lewis, for moderating so expertly uh, as well. Um, so we're, we're at the close. In a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Ryan just to say a little bit more about the menu uh, that hopefully you're going to stay and try. Um, um, but it's my job to try to bring some of those themes together or at least list them out. And um, I guess there was a couple of things that, that came to mind. I mean, the first thing is that for Compass and for um, our competitors, and there are competitors um, connected into this, uh, to this call, either online or here in the room, um, this was never meant to be a declaration of victory or, um, or a celebration of, of what's been achieved so far. It was always meant to be, and I think it's done the job absolutely brilliantly. Um, a, uh, a provision of a platform to have a proper debate and get us all thinking about the roles that we can play ourselves in our organizations, in our agencies, in our whoever we represent, and even just in our own, um, with our own families, um, to start our own leadership journeys here. Um, secondly, um, I think there's, we've just seen how complicated and how many different points of view and how many different elements there are to this journey. Um, there are lots of tensions at play. We just saw a few government versus individuals, speed versus fairness, education versus legislation, young versus uh, not so young, um, and, and, and many more. Um, and that I think that particularly the last panel there just um, brought some of those, those dichotomies together uh, in, a really, um, in a really interesting way. But I think the thing which strikes me more than ever is that this is a team game. This is not something that any of us is going to be able to do by ourselves. We're too reliant on each other to be able to, um, to, to set off on our own path. It has to be something that we do as a movement, as a group of people, as a collection of suppliers, clients, agencies, consultants, everybody else. So I think that's the most, that's the most important thing to remember. And um, Christian actually hit the nail on the head. He said, everything is possible. And I think that's a great thing uh, to leave this uh, conference with today. So just before we finally say goodbye, uh, Ryan, I'm hoping that you're a bit closer. Where are you? Are you just going to say a word or two about the menu? Thank you, Robin. So we're almost ready to enjoy tonight's carbon menu and, um, as Lewis put, the cocktails and the shiny disco lights as well. But before we do, uh, I just wanted to talk about the principles and the approach to how we put this menu together and how we build our menus at Compass Group. We've seen the videos already, two of our fantastic suppliers, and we've built this menu around celebrating British seasonal and sustainable produce. We've adopted a plant-forward approach, always leading with vegetables, with meat and fish secondary, and plant-based dishes always at the top of the menu. We've worked with Oxford University on the LEAP project, so tonight's menu has been environmentally scored. Minimizing food waste. This is something that we're proudly promoting. Root to stem cooking is as standard. And the language and tone is so important. We haven't used the words vegan, vegetarian, plant-based, or healthy. We don't want to label. This menu is inclusive to both flexitarians and vegans. Ultimately, the dishes on the menu are tasty plates of food, regardless of whether they contain meat or whether they're plant-based. Flavor is paramount. We've applied the same approach and principles to our COP26 menus, which we look forward to showcasing with our Glasgow SEC client at COP26 later on this year. I'll hand you back over to Robin. Thanks, Ryan. Um, most of all, many thanks to all our contributors and speakers. Um, thanks for being so straightforward, speaking your mind, getting to the point. I was really grateful. Um, thank you to all of you who uh, turned up today. Uh, many of you turned up today, which, um, which we're really grateful for. And to those of you who, um, who connected online, um, we hope it's been as positive experience as it has been here in the room. And uh, thank you all, and have a safe journey home.